came to that critical date in 1859 when Darwin's Origin of Species was released. Darwin had been in correspondence with Asa Gray, the botanist at Harvard, who early on indicated that he was quite open to the notion of organic evolution, as long as it didn't mean that he somehow had to get rid of God completely. And uh, therefore, when Darwin was published, and Asa Gray wrote a review of Darwin's Origin of Species in 1859, there was immediately a pro-Darwinian argument right here at Harvard. Curiously, the strongest immediate critique of Darwinism in the United States also came from Harvard, the zoologist Louis Agassiz. For Agassiz, there was more direction in nature. And they entered a debate. And there were several head-on confrontations that took place initially at the Boston Society of Natural History in downtown Boston, where, as the newspapers recorded at the time, many, many people turned out to see these two local titans of science go head-to-head about Darwinian evolution. It's fair to say Asa Gray won out Gray's propagation of evolution lived on through the remainder of the 19th century and became part of uh, the evolutionary synthesis. Gray could be seen by the end of the century as a classic Darwinian evolutionist. You saw the emergence of a conscious attempt to make a synthesis between Mendelian genetics and Darwinian evolution. And one of the key figures in that unification came to Harvard after the Second World War, and this was the zoologist Ernst Meyer. And it's Meyer who, together with several other key evolutionists and geneticists, put forward the new Darwinian or evolutionary synthesis in which they brought together Mendelian genetics and Darwinian evolution. Alfred Roma, the vertebrate scholar, developed through time a fairly sophisticated understanding of the evolution of vertebrates, one of the hardest fields in which to bring evolutionary thought to bear. Uh, But through his lectures, through his classes, and through some marvelous textbooks, he left his mark on an understanding of the evolution of vertebrates as part of the broader evolutionary synthesis. Here at Harvard, an early Darwinian proponent of the new forms of understanding nature was E.O. Wilson, Edward O. Wilson, an entomologist. His book, entitled Sociobiology, was one that brought him into controversy. And it's there that Wilson extended the evolutionary understanding of the way changes occur in nature to an evolutionary understanding of the behavior of animals, from insects right up to human beings. He was aware, as he wrote that book, that to extend the understanding of social behavior of animals to humans uh, was to take a step fraught with social and political implications. And it's in the context of that book that a series of debates take place, some of them right here at Harvard. Richard Lewinton and Stephen Jay Gould, two Younger contemporaries of Wilson were more committed to a vision that human beings and human societies were largely shaped by human social, political, economic choices, and in a sense withheld, rejected in part, the belief that you could understand social behavior among human beings as a largely biological phenomenon. Each of these three left their stamp on science as well as projecting to the broader public. Gould and Wilson engaged in public debates. They each loved 
to be before an audience and explain nature as they saw it. And to sit and listen to them was sheer pleasure as they were able to evoke what it was that was happening in nature and to bring the non-expert right into the middle of the discussions of the intricacies of the sciences of life.